Anyway, happy Pi Day. We're going to uh, get into uh, uh, our lecture and uh, we were just finishing off our, or actually we we're just getting started talking about fluoride. And if you recall, I played this video for you and it talked a little bit about fluoride and teeth. And uh, it's kind of a good background to fluoride. I'm not gonna play it again, um, but there's a few things just to say about it. If you're interested in a little bit more about the chemistry, I encourage you to check out this uh, particular uh, infographic. It's talking about the different types of uh, fluoride that can be added to water. And uh, maybe it would be worth it sometime to blow this up a little bit. If you take a look at this map here, uh, there's the interesting thing, as you can see, in terms of which countries fluoridate their water, uh, it, it's um, definitely a, a Western Hemisphere kind of thing for some reason. Uh, Europe and Asia and, and Africa tends to be a lot less common for some reason. And, uh, you know, it's talking a little bit about the facts about uh, fluoridation and whatnot, which is something I'm going to get into in, in a couple of minutes here. So a little bit more about fluoride. Uh, it's naturally found in water, as I mentioned before, in many places around um, in the Athabasca. I feel like I read somewhere that the Athabasca River concentration typically ranges from about 0 0.1 to 0 0.4 ppm. I feel like I read that somewhere, Athabasca. So we have a little bit of uh, fluoride in the water here. Some places geographically have a lot more. Uh, some have very little. Uh, so it's something that is in the water. And uh, that's how we kind of figured out that it was helping people's teeth, because you can look at different cities and you can see uh, that the cities, uh, the population is maybe very similar types of people and different habits, um, whereas the fl uh, fluoridation is the, is the big difference. And that's kind of how it was figured out. So I think I finished on, on this slide here. And I was just saying uh, that uh, um, the side effect of having too much fluoride is this issue called fluorosis. And fluorosis is really just uh, the teeth getting uh, stains and colors in it. And uh, this is not bad for you, it's just cosmetically, it's not fun. And uh, every once in a while, I do find someone who ended up in this category. And this is the reason why they tell you if you have kids, uh, you know, when they're young, and they don't know how to spit out their toothpaste, that you should be giving them a teeny tiny amount because kids will of course swallow that toothpaste and we don't wanna to have too much excess fluoride in the body and can lead to uh, um, teeth modeling. So I just looked it up here uh, today and this was the number I found for the MIC for fluoride in the Canadian Drinking Water Guidelines. Can't remember where I found this number uh, and uh, Found it a few years ago, saying that they're recommending it's kind of down to the 0.7 range, just to uh, you know prevent any mottling or anything like that. Uh, like I said, I can't remember where I have read that number. Uh, I'm gonna have to look that up again another time. Um, but there's a few other things to say about uh, about fluoridation. Because there's a lot of a uh, lot of myths around it. It's one of these areas that I found if you uh, start googling it, it's this wormhole of internet conspiracy theories. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about some of the myths. First of all, the myth that it's not natural. We've already addressed that. It's found in water. Uh, it's from the geology. Uh, it's, it's a natural thing. Uh, it's not unnatural. Um, some people claim water fluoridation doesn't work. Uh, we've got almost 100 years of data to show otherwise. And I'm gonna talk about uh, the city of Calgary here in a minute. And there's a lot of good data to show what's happened in Calgary. Uh, as, as an example of a recent study that's done. Actually, several recent studies have been done in Calgary. Uh, there's lots of ideas that fluoridation is going to cause you to become stupid, reduce your IQ, cause cancer, and those kind of things. Huge list of those things. And uh, there's not really any good research to kind of confirm those things. Now, some, some of the research, um, th there are a few studies done in rats and things like that where um, they're feeding rats unusually high numbers of things, such as um, fluoride, and sometimes you see side effects in those cases. Uh, but um, that's true with anything. Almost anything is toxic when given in high enough doses. And uh, these are the kinds of studies that people are often uh, citing, unfortunately. So I want to show you this. This is kind of a map showing what's going on in Canada. And you can see that in terms of water fluoridation, uh, Alberta is, uh, it's about half anyway, which is kind of consistent with many parts in Canada. 
Uh, you can see across Canada about 40%, uh, Quebec a lot lower, New Brunswick very minimal, uh, maritime, other maritime uh, provinces a little higher and so on. So just thought I'd show you that, it's kind of interesting. So the other thing I want to show you, which I thought was kind of humorous, is I, I Googled water fluoridation. And in the top 10 links, I found um, reasons to fluoridate or reasons not to fluoridate. So I want to just show you these as a comparison because they're kind of, kind of funny. Here was from the Canadian Dental Association, right? So I Googled and they said, reasons to fluoridate. They're saying it's safe and effective, method of uh, preventing cavities. Uh, cost effective, um, you know, about a dollar a person per year, apparently. And um, the big argument for water fluoridation is that uh, you can basically get everyone. Uh, and, um, you know, it's safe and, you know, there's humanitarian reasons for doing it and all that. Um, interestingly, I think this was number four on the Google list of water fluoridation, which was the Fluoride Action Network. And so this is an anti-fluoridation group. And uh, I'll show you their first three reasons. They say it's not safe. They say it's unnecessary and effective and that it's a, a form of mass medication. And a lot of their arguments behind not fluoridation is kind of what we're seeing in the last couple of years around masking and vaccines. They say it's taking away choice. You're, you're mass medicating people and those kind of things. And, Honestly, it's one of these things that I don't feel really strongly about one way or another. Um, people have access to toothpaste nowadays. We know what causes uh, cavities. Um, do it or not, I don't, don't really care quite honestly. Um, but let's just talk about Calgary for a minute or two here. Um, I'm gonna, I've got a little video I'm gonna share with you here in a moment. And um, some of you may or may not know that Calgary has been debating this issue on and off for like, I don't know, years, probably a hundred years, who knows? Um, I know when I was looking this up, there, uh, there was a timeline of, of how many times this has been debated in council in Calgary. So in 2011, uh, they had realized that their fluoridation um, area needed an upgrade. It had outlived its function and it would cost, I don't know what it was, it was something like $10 million to upgrade it, right? And they debated it and decided they didn't want to spend the money. So in 2011, they stopped fluoridating the water. And um, since then, so that's about 10 years now, um, within two years, they actually found, now you can see at the bottom of the screen, that in baby teeth, a 65% increase in cavities compared to Edmonton, which was 14%. So why are we comparing with Edmonton? Because the city of Edmonton did not stop fluoridating. And, and so there you have kind of your, an experiment done. You have two populations, large populations, about a million each, and, uh, and one population has stopped fluoridating. So you have lots of numbers on this. And there's the study. I'll play this little video for you. It's kind of eye-opening and talks a little bit about what uh, um, some of the debate was about. So this is the uh, link here. I just gotta make sure my volume is on. I already played this to get rid of the ads. And this is just a clip from CBC News. So I'll play that for you right now. I don't think it's a big surprise. And I think it'll stimulate a new debate, as you said. It's already started some of the hallways at City Hall. I've lofted the idea on the way out the door. And people are thinking again. Um, it's a little bit what some of us expected, that we would see a rise in tooth decay. And oftentimes in children, and oftentimes children in difficult, disadvantaged, poverty situations. Mm -hmm. And the funding that we committed to try and address that issue at the time, I'm not sure is doing the trick. So take us back in time a little bit. What was the main reason that City Council voted to take fluoride out of the water in the first place? I think there were three elements to it, actually. One was money. It came up during a budget debate, $750,000 a year to pay for the fluoride and the operating costs. And at the time, a $5 million Price, tack, price ticket to actually improve the quality of the machinery necessary. So that would be more today. The jurisdictional issues, is it really a, a municipality's operations, uh, respon operational responsibility to look after essentially health? And thirdly, um, whether or not we wanted to spend the money. 
So now that there's some scientific scientific evidence that uh, it actually does prevent tooth decay in children, is that a wake-up call for counselor? And what do you plan to do about it? Well, I'm going to try and start the discussion again. I'm frankly not that optimistic at this point that I can find eight votes. But I think perhaps if it's positioned this time as if the, in cooperation with the provincial government, were they to come to the table and say, okay, we'll look after the financial element if you look after the distribution through your water system. That might have a little bit more support on City Council. So is this a money issue in the end? It seems to have started out as one. It came about as a result of a discussion at budget when somebody asked, what will it cost to keep fluoride in the water and what's this about the significant capital cost for new pumping? And so from there it turned into a notice of motion and from there we ended up with the 11-3 vote. Hypothetical here, let's say the province says, sure, we'll help kick in. Do you think that's going to make it easier to pass? It would make it closer. Uh, I think we'd have an interesting debate. We also have to understand a little bit more perhaps about this tooth decay issue. Edmonton still had a, a lot of tooth decay. Right. This isn't the magic bullet. There are probably a lot of other factors involved perhaps dealing with what a disadvantaged person's diet looks like. So I think we have to understand a little bit more about that whole issue as well as fluoride and put that together in the same context. Will you be an advocate for this as we go along, though? I'll be an advocate as much as I can be and see whether or not I can bring this to the floor of council with some chance of success. What do you expect the opposition to be if it's not just money? Well, what I was told this afternoon by some friends is that um, and colleagues on council is that it really is, is it appropriate for a municipality to be mass dosing a population with what is essentially viewed by some as an industrial byproduct. And furthermore, is this really the right role of a municipal order of government to be providing this level of health care and dental care? So even if the money situation gets sorted out, there's still going to be that controversy underneath it all. Yeah, so that's why I think it might be close, but I'm up for the fight. Okay, so you can see, um, you know, some of the conversation here, things I kind of was talking about a little bit there. It's amazing how political these things become around uh, <laughs> public health, unfortunately. Um, but the interesting thing about this story is that um, just recently, so in November, um, the city council overturned it, and they've been debating this for about two years now. And uh, they realized it's going to cost them six to $10 million for the upgrade and about a million dollars annually for uh, treating the water and, and upkeeping the, the plant. So anyway, kind of an interesting debate. Uh, like I said, it's not something that I feel like I need to go march down to City Hall about uh, or anything like that, but I thought it was interesting to see the parallels with what's been going on with the, uh, the pandemic as well. Um, but uh, there is good science behind it. Um, whether it's worth the money or not, I don't really know. Um, that's some, somebody else's decision to make, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about fluoridation in, in the Fort McMurray plant here in the, in the next unit. Okay, so um, last part of this unit, I just want to talk a little bit about um, uh, some other characteristics of water. We were just talking about, uh, um, we are talking about solids, right? And that was last week's lab, and then continuing this week. And uh, so there's a few other things uh, in terms of water parameters to, to discuss. And, and a lot of these things we've actually talked about already. So hardness, for example, is something we've talked about. And uh, just a reminder what hardness does, hard water will leave a, a deposit on your, you know, a ring around your tub and maybe some scaling on your pipes and some residues in your, um, in your uh, water kettle and, and, uh, and your soap won't lather as well. Uh, generally, it tastes better. And calcium and magnesium are actually good for your health. Um, the disadvantage of soft water, even though your soap may lather better, is that soft water tends to uh, dissolve um, toxic metals a lot more readily, things like cadmium and lead and those kind of things. Uh, so water hardness is something we do look at. It's doesn't not a bad for your health, just maybe bad for your plumbing. Um, so what about chlorine? We're gonna be talking a lot more about chlorine in the next unit. Uh, chlorine is a, uh, is a gas and uh, it dissolves in, easily in water. And uh, it's uh, basically a disinfectant. When it dissolves in water, you're basically making bleach and bleach will kill microorganisms. So this is a disinfectant and sometimes found in water depending on how it's treated in a particular city. So we'll talk more about that in the next unit. Uh, one thing to consider about chlorine in terms of water parameters is we, uh, you're not really supposed to discharge chlorinated water into the environment. 
because it will affect aquatic organisms. So you can see this is talking about uh, the effect of chlorine on, on mostly fish. And uh, even small amounts are enough to, uh, to kill trout. Trout, um, by the way, trout tend to be quite the um, um, biological indicator because they're very, very sensitive. They need high amounts of oxygen and they're sensitive to chemicals. And uh, so you can see they're talking about trout fry. Uh, trout fry basically mean young trout. And, um, and that's kind of a test that can be done on water samples sometimes. As you put the trout fry in the water, if the trout live, the water is probably pretty good. Uh, and that's uh, kind of a, in some ways that's a standard test. It is done once in a while with water uh, to, to see how, um, how healthy it is. You can see it's mentioning other organisms there, but trout tends to be something we think about a lot in Canada. We have trout and uh, it's kind of a high standard anyway. Um, nitrates and phosphates. So remember these here, these are gonna cause your algal blooms or some sort of eutrophication event and uh, because they're fertilizers, right? And uh, so these things can come from a variety of sources, uh, agricultural sources, uh, actually, uh, whether it's uh, fertilizers or um, manure, animal waste, also from human sewage. If there is a situation where human sewage is uh, getting into a water supply, the nitrates and phosphates will be, will be rich there as well. So this is something that we're testing for in our water, particularly actually our wastewater before we're allowed to discharge it into the, uh, into the river. So we'll get to that when we talk about uh, wastewater treatment. Uh, acidity, we talked a little bit about that. It uh, makes water a little bit more reactive and can corrode pipes and whatnot. Alkalinity, very similar to acidity in terms of the fact that it's, uh, it's uh, relatively reactive and alkalinity, we're usually talking about uh, uh, carbonate and bicarbonate of course. And uh, again, this is something that can have an effect on fish. And uh, there's a lake trout for you and you can see um, it's talking about fish uh, avoiding that water. And notice it's correlating this to carbon dioxide because of course carbon dioxide will make your carbonic acid and contribute to carbonate and bicarbonate. And uh, in fact, many species, um, uh, they can't either spawn or hatch their eggs in higher concentrations, unfortunately. Uh, I guess we talked a little bit about volatile organics. Uh, there was, uh, when we were talking about the solids uh, during last lecture, I'd mentioned there is a test for volatile organic solids and I think I remember what it is, you heat it up to uh, 300 degrees or something like that. And, and so volatile means things that can evaporate. And a lot of these are from um, industrial uh, manufacturing, uh, sometimes home chemical activities. And so these, a lot of these are, are, um, are chemicals that we're, we're concerned about toxic effects, really is what, what the whole point is. And uh, so this is something that can be measured by doing that, that test that we had talked about last day. Um, sometimes when we look at these organic chemicals, uh, sometimes they're kind of sifted into different categories based on who's classifying them. So sometimes people talk about volatile organics. Sometimes people talk about synthetic organics. So synthetic means things that are made by humans and they're not usually naturally found in the environment. Um, synthetic doesn't necessarily mean toxic and it doesn't necessarily mean non-biodegradable. Uh, although there tends to be that correlation in that synthetic organic chemicals tend to be less biodegradable because they're not naturally seen in the environment. Um, and this includes plastics as well, by the way. And plastics, of course, don't degrade very readily in the environment, not very quickly. Uh, notice this comment here about some of them can be absorbed through the lung skins and uh, gastrointestinal tracts. Uh, so that's obviously something that we're concerned about. Uh, something that I... Uh, uh, I think I talked about, I'm trying to remember what the context was, um, but I was talking about these things here, these PAHs. So PAHs stand for polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. So polycyclic means there's multiple rings in the chemical structure. Uh, aromatic usually means it's related to benzene. So benzene is like this. So it's six carbons and it's got... Uh, it's got three double bonds. So that's benzene like that. And anytime you see something that uh, says aromatic, 
it usually means it's, it's a compound uh, related to benzene. So it used to be thought that things that smell had uh, these um, chemical structures to them, right? And so that's where the word aromatic came from. We found out that that's not the case, but then the name is sort of stuck. So if you ever see aromatic, it means it's related to benzene. So you can see there's a whole bunch there. Uh, there's hundreds of chemicals on this list. Uh, and some of them are pretty nasty. They're carcinogens. Some of them are less nasty. Um, and a whole bunch of these things are on, um, you know, lists of, of bad pollutants. And uh, so this is something that uh, um, you might hear about it once in a while when people are testing water or soil, um, in particular soil uh, is where you might see these uh, quite a bit more than, than water. So where do these things come from? Um, all sorts of sources, natural sources and unnatural sources. So forest fires, anywhere that you have uh, some sort of combustion of organic compounds. And um, if the combustion is not complete, like complete combustion will yield carbon dioxide and water. Uh, incomplete combustion, which happens almost all the time, leaves sorts of byproducts and these PAHs being one of the byproducts. So you can see a bunch of things here that we're probably more concerned about, things like oil spills, um, pollution from our, our automobiles. So you're gonna see uh, these PAHs, by the way, uh, you're gonna see them in basically the three main things that where you're gonna see pollution, water, air, and soil. Uh, industry, of course, and refineries, those are some other sources that we can uh, control a little bit. Forest fires, maybe not as much. They're more of a natural thing and food. We're not gonna stop eating food, uh, but you know there is combustion involved there, right? So what about these things? Do they affect health? Um, they're, they are a health concern, but the research is kind of mixed because there's, well, we're talking about hundreds of different chemicals, right? And uh, so there seems to be an indication that, that some types are definitely nasty. In fact, like I said, we know that some are associated with uh, certain cancers. And you can see they're talking about lung cancer and skin cancer, because if you're inhaling it uh, in your lungs, uh, that's where you're gonna get the cancer, of course. And uh, there's some that are probably less harmful, uh, but it is kind of a measure, again, another one of those measures of pollution um, particularly, you, see, you hear a lot of talk about pHs with, uh, with soil and air uh, pollution. Um, what else is going to say about these ones here? Uh, so these are some guidelines for, from Environment Canada about certain uh, polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. And uh, you can look up those structures if you want. But basically, uh, these are kind of like the MACs, the maximum acceptable concentrations for these things in natural sources. And uh, so I imagine some places, some industries have to be monitoring these things before they discharge wastewater into the environment. Okay, and um, one of the other things to consider with water are something called secondary standards. So a lot of those other things we we're talking about were, um, I guess you call them primary standards, meaning that your water, has to be at this amount. You can't have more than 1.5 milligrams per liter of fluoride, for example. Secondary standards are things that you can see that by definition, they're making the water less desirable, but not related to health risks. So we don't want excess iron in our water. For example, excess iron in our water is going to make give the water a color. Uh, it's not going to be bad for human health, but we don't want things to look ugly, right? And, you're going to see complaints and, and people concerned about their water. So these are, these are kind of uh, secondary. The ones I'm showing you here in this list are not Canadian standards. These are American standards. So some of the numbers might be a little bit different. Um, but you, you get the idea. I'm hoping. I think that is actually the last slide for this unit. So we were almost done last day. So like I said, a number of these things we're going to come back to and talk about uh, in the next uh, unit or two. So let me just load up that next uh, PowerPoint here. So we're gonna kind of shift over now and I wanna talk about water processing. Um, so unfortunately, we're not gonna get a chance to go see the drinking water plant, but I will be talking about it, uh, the local one uh, next day, probably on Wednesday, we'll talk about it a little bit. I'm glad we were able to set up the, uh, the wastewater plant. That's actually the more interesting tour, by the way. 
the drinking water plant is, is tends to be a lot less interesting than the tour. Uh, it's just not, the whole building is just kind of set up in a way that it's kind of hard to figure out what's going on, if that makes any sense. Uh, so I talked a little bit about drinking water processing once or twice already. And now what we want to do is basically get into and talk about uh, a lot of the details here. So you can see this scheme here is showing kind of a basic plan. You usually have a water source here way at the beginning and it's going through different types of treatment. You can see preliminary treatment, a clarification, filtration, a disinfection, fluoridation, those kind of things. And all those things we're gonna talk about in a little bit of detail here. Um, another thing I was gonna point out, oops, go back to here is we're not going on a tour, but um, you can check out, we're gonna actually watch this video in class. Uh, and if you want some more information, you can also try this video. Those two cities, Winnipeg and Saskatoon, actually have some uh, really nice videos that show what their treatment system looks like. And, and uh, they're kind of similar to what goes on here. There are some differences. Every city has its own differences, of course. Okay, so let's talk about um, why we're treating our water. Uh, we talked about this already, last unit. Uh, we're talking about this, you know, why do we treat our water? Uh, first of all, it has to be drinkable. Um, so this is the word that we use, potable, uh, and that means that it's uh, safe for human consumption, right? And so mostly that we're looking at chemical qualities of that water and also the bacteriology uh, quality uh, and, and other microbes, right? Uh, we're also treating our water because we want it to look and taste nice. Uh, like I said, that's more related to those secondary standards. So maybe I'll write that down. Secondary standards. And uh, you know, those are things like color and taste and odor and whatnot, and things that may not necessarily affect our health, but uh, people are gonna complain or you're not gonna like the water. Uh, third reason is just industry, right? And uh, you think about a town like Fort McMurray, there's all sorts of small industries around town. There's laundromats, there's uh, dry cleaners, restaurants, uh, you know, all of those kind of things. And sometimes there's bigger industries that are taking the water treated um, by the municipality, using them for some, something or another. Um, the oil sands companies have their own water treatment facilities uh, for their uses. and, and um, and they're bringing into whatever quality they needed for the various uses. You can see this note I have here, it says that, uh, that some guidelines may require further demineralization. And, uh, and it says, why is that? And that is mostly to do with the fact that, well, we have got hard water and hard water can scale on pipes and it can also scale on machinery. And when you've got machinery worth millions and millions of dollars, um, it's worth it to clean your water up even more so. In order, to, um, in order to get rid of uh, that scaling that can ultimately lead to the breakdown of your equipment. Okay, uh, so going back a few units here, actually this should say topic six, I believe. Uh, actually, I'm not sure which topic I'm referring to here. Maybe the last topic. Uh, so it says here, what are some factors that affect water quality? So usually what I do is I start writing some things on the board. Um, but uh, probably the number one thing people are thinking of is, of course, pollution. And going back to our last topic, whatever number that was, there are a whole bunch of different types of things we were talking about. So we had, remember, agriculture. I can't remember all of the, uh, of the uh, um, categories, but uh, agriculture, we had things like uh, road salt, Um, industry, manufacturing, manufacturing, uh, what else? We had uh, mining, I guess that's kind of like industry manufacturing, which usually considered its own category. Uh, we could have human sewage. Anyway, you get the idea. Um, there's a lot of human things that can affect water quality. I'm sure you could add to this list if you go back to the last unit and take a look at all those categories that we were talking about. Um, there are, of course, natural things as well that are going to affect water quality. So the seasons, for example. 
And for example, in the spring, you have your, um, your spring runoff or your spring melt, whatever you want to call it. And in the spring, you've got all that snow melting and it's bringing all sorts of uh, debris and, and uh, dissolved solids into the river. And then we're taking water from the river. So that is a big deal. Uh, there's also natural weathering and erosion. Weathering, erosion. And then the last one I'll add on here is wildlife. Right, wildlife are living in that water and they're doing all their business there. So that can be a concern or maybe it's not a concern depending on, on the actual water source. Um, so all of these things are contributing to the water being not clean. And so we have to think about taking or remo removing many of these things from the water uh, and getting it up to a standard that it is considered uh, drinkable water, right, for human health. So we've talked a lot about those standards and now what we wanna do is talk about how we're gonna get it towards those standards. And if you think about it, um, you kind of have two things going on here, right? You've got, um, you've got chemicals that, and, and by chemicals, I mean almost anything, dissolved solids and whatnot that we're trying to reduce. And the other is we have microorganisms that we're trying to kill. And so there's kind of two things going on here, right? We've got one is getting rid of solids, and number two is, is disinfecting, which is killing microorganisms. So we can think of uh, water treatment as, as those two different problems. Um, here's some more standards from the guidelines for Canadian drinking water. And uh, you can see we have the primary standards there on the left, so the MACs. And uh, on the right are the secondary standards, the uh, uh, or aesthetic objectives. And so this was something I was commenting on in people's lab reports when they're talking about copper and iron. There are no maximum values for copper and iron uh, for the MACs. Copper and iron have AOs, which are aesthetic qualities uh, that they're trying to um, keep, but they're not gonna affect health, they're just gonna affect taste and color. Uh, notice, um, some of these standards here, I always thought, think this is funny. Odor, inoffensive. <laughs> um, I think we all know what that means. I don't know how you measure inoffensive, but um, I'm pretty sure everyone knows exactly what that means. Here's another one that I'm not too sure about. They measure color somehow. I don't know exactly what a TCU is. I guess it's a true color unit. Uh, I don't know what instrument they use for that. Um, I have no idea how that's, that's determined. Uh, and whether that's even an issue around in Fort McMurray or not. Uh, something else that we talked about as well is uh, um, this multi-barrier approach to uh, drinking water. And um, this involves several mechanisms to do something with the water. And so that if one mechanism fails, we, all, we have all those other mechanisms that may be helpful. So you can see uh, number one is protecting the source making sure that does not get polluted. Number two is having a water treatment plant. Number three is having um, the water disinfected while it's being distributed. And that's where chlorination comes from because the chlorine is a persistent chemical in the water and lasts long enough in the pipes to get to somebody's home. And then of course, proper storage and piping and all those kind of things that are maintained and not allowing contaminants to be able to get in. Uh, so we want to kind of focus in and talk about two and, and three in this unit, uh, which is the water treatment part. And uh, oh, one thing that I forgot last time was testing, right? So the testing is just confirming that what we're doing at each of these stages is indeed working for us. Okay, so let's talk about um, our typical plant here. And uh, what I'm going to do is talk about some of these things. I'm not going to get through all of them. And next day, what I'm going to do is kind of draw a, a sketch on the board for you to show you uh, kind of how all of these things are put together. Uh, so let's talk about these things here. Um, first is uh, the screens. I'm not really going to talk about screens too much, but screens are, you could imagine you've got some sort of grill or grate and, uh, you know, the water is going through and it's keeping out sticks, fish, things like that, uh, or at least the big chunks anyway. Uh, see, I've got a little note here on water supply. Uh, so let's talk about that first, maybe. Um, 
uh, I guess we talked about this a, bit, a little bit already, right? In Canada, um, most of our water for cities is from rivers or lakes and reservoirs. Um, in some places you're looking at groundwater and uh, in the States, groundwater is much, much more common in some places like the city of Los Angeles uh, taps into a massive aquifer uh, for part of its water supply. And uh, so they're concerned about that now because of course it's just dry. It's been drying up for about a decade or so now, unfortunately. Um, so what was this all about? Okay, we talked about this a little bit, um, basically protecting uh, our water supplies, protecting our river, not allowing it to get uh, polluted. We're also monitoring it and so on. Yes, those, those kind of things. So let's talk about the treatment, okay? Uh, and um, you can see, I kind of have this broken into two categories, right? Primary processes and disinfection. So disinfection, you got to sort of think of it as a separate process because really it is designed to kill microorganisms, not necessarily remove them. Although the, the first, the primary processes may remove um, a significant quantity of them. Uh, but disinfection, the goal is to kill these things. Uh, and they may still be present in the water. And it's not a big deal if you drink a few uh, when they're dead kind of thing, right? So let's talk about these processes. And, and it's kind of worth it to break these down and to, and to discuss what is going on. Uh, so first, let's talk about aeration. Um, we don't do this here. Uh, aeration is literally just adding air, right? So we can just say that adding air. So why would you do this? Um, you would do this if you had a groundwater supply. Uh, groundwater tends to have sometimes uh, weird smells or organics in there. And uh, the aeration is providing basically air, which has oxygen in it, and the oxygen can actually oxidize a number of these compounds and, um, and get rid of them. And that's the whole idea behind it. You can see that we're providing air for the fish here, uh, and the air in the fish tank doesn't just um, give the fish dissolved oxygen, but it also actually helps improve the smell of the water as well uh, by doing the same thing, oxidizing various organics and other compounds. So that's kind of what the, what the air is all about. You can see there's a facility there in California and they're adding air to the water before it goes off to you know, whatever the next uh, step is uh, in, the, uh, in the water treatment. So let's talk about coagulation, sedimentation and filtration. This is kind of a big thing to talk about and we'll probably talk, uh, I'm not sure if we'll get to filtration today or not, but we'll see. Um, so this goes way back to topic three. We were talking about uh, in topic three was water chemistry, and we talked about dissolved ions and hardness and, and alkalinity and all that. And uh, kind of near the end of that, we talked about other things that could be in the water. And one of the things we talked about was colloids. So colloids, I can't remember the exact definition, but I think it's particles that are uh, about um, about zero point one micrometers and larger. I'm not sure if that's the exact definition. It could be 0 0.2 or 0 0.4 or something like that, but somewhere in that range. Uh, so what we're talking about are, um, in many cases, uh, things like bacteria, clay, uh, all sorts of other things. Now, one of the things about clay uh, is that often it is a charged mineral. And this is a problem because it's the same mineral and these minerals are like charged. And uh, so in many cases, what you're talking about are uh, negatively charged minerals. And I don't know what types of minerals are in clay. I don't know anything about clay, quite honestly. Uh, but if you have light charges, they're going to repel each other. And this is a problem because um, they, they will probably settle out eventually, uh, but it's probably going to take years. And we want to treat that water now. And uh, so this is the whole idea. So how do we get rid of charged particles? We add in a counter charge. And so this particular process is called coagulation. So coagulation, you can think of it as clumping. And uh, so you can see we're adding something called a coagulant. And we'll talk about that in a second. And so the whole idea is you add this coagulant, it's going to attract those charged particles, and you're going to make these clumps. And these clumps are called flock. So I didn't invent this word. Um, it's kind of a funny word, but you're going to see the term flocculation as um, uh, referring to this type of water treatment. 
So the flock is heavier particles and it tends to sink to the bottom. And so this is the whole idea. So you have all this flock or this sludge at the bottom, you can get rid of that and you can keep this water here and it can go on to the next step. So let's talk a little bit about how that, uh, um, what we're working for that. There is another um, uh, slide kind of showing these colloids. Like I said, they're usually uh, a lot of clay is negatively uh, charged. And one of the most commonly used coagulants is something called alum. And alum is basically aluminum uh, sulfate, I believe. Um, it's the aluminum though, that is kind of the, the most important part because the aluminum you can see is Al3 uh, positive. So you have these positive charges and um, you make the flock. The flock settles out and, um, and that's kind of the end of it. And aluminum is kind of, it doesn't really have a taste to it. And, and uh, it's, uh, it's harmless. And um, you know, this, this sludge or this flock they take out, it just, it just basically gets shipped to the landfill and, uh, and it's not really a big deal. Uh, there it is, yes, aluminum sulfate. So that's what it looks like. It's kind of a, it's a white powder and uh, there's different formulations that they use for the alum. Uh, I think I had also seen an alum uh, aluminum chloride somewhere. Um, like I said, there's a bunch of these things out there, but, uh, but alum is the most common one, which is aluminum sulfate. Uh, you can see down there at the bottom that sometimes places might use iron compounds. So ferric sulfate or ferrous sulfate can also be used. Now, the one problem about iron is that iron, of course, has a color to it and also more of a taste. And so if you have to use lots of the iron salts, uh, that's a problem. Uh, I think in small amounts, it's not usually a big deal. And the, the plus is you're adding iron to the water and lots of people are iron deficient, but it's usually really not enough to make any difference. Um, the biggest difference is that people might notice the color or the taste. And that's where, that's what we're, we're going to start complaining. And that's what people care about. Uh, you can see all these other names. And one of the other things you might find if you ever end up in the water treatment industry is that everything has other names. So potash right? Potash is a type of alum. And uh, so they're just they're using another word for meaning the same thing. Um, there's another one, which is PAC. I'm trying to remember what that one stands for. Uh, I think it's poly aluminum chloride or something like that. And uh, that one there actually has some, uh, the poly means it actually has a plastic polymer in there. And uh, I don't really know what the chemical makeup of it is, is but it's, it's basically another it's another type of aluminum uh, salt that they're adding to the water to take out the, uh, the clay. So the, the coagulation and the sedimentation kind of go together, by the way. So the coagulation is when you throw this stuff in and often you mix it and then you let it settle. And so the sedimentation um, goes by another name. It's also called clarification. So when you allow water to uh, sediment, it becomes more clear. And so clarification is kind of actually a pretty good word for it. Uh, so this is the removal of these things. And so this is usually done by gravity, right? We're just allowing this stuff to settle to the bottom. And what I want to show you is some different ways you can allow this to occur uh, in a water treatment plant. And I'll show you some pictures from uh, our water treatment plant. Uh, so here's one uh, sedimentation basin here. And um, Actually, I'm not familiar with this particular design, but in this case here, I think what they do is just, uh, just let it fill up and then, and then let it settle out. I'll show you some better designs though. So here's a pretty common uh, clarifier design. So these sedimentation tanks, by the way, are often called clarifiers. And uh, we're gonna get a chance to see some of these clarifiers at the water treatment plant. And uh, they'll probably let us walk out on the bridge. And uh, basically it looks like a giant um, circular pond. But if you take a look at the lower part of this slide, you can see what is going on here. So the water is actually coming in in the middle, right? And so it's going here and it's basically coming out of the middle through some pipes. So you can imagine there's a, a decent amount of flow here. And uh, at the bottom, you've got these big arms here and these are sludge scrapers. And so what you wanna do is allow the water to come in and not be very turbulent, right? You don't want the flock or whatever's settling out to get mixed back in. 
So it's most turbulent at the inside where the water's coming in. And these big blades at the bottom are basically scraping the bottom. And they're actually moving relatively slowly and they're scraping all the sludge into this thing here. And so there's a big pump at the bottom that pumps out the sludge. And like I said, that is gonna go and get sent to a landfill or, or whatever. Uh, and the water itself is slowly, as, as it's slowly moving towards the outside of the, um, outside of the clarifier, uh, the water is moving in that direction and the particles are slowly sinking. So by the time the water gets to the edge, you can see there's a little tray here. It's gonna go into that little tray and it's gonna be relatively clean by the time it gets there. Uh, these clarifiers are really quite amazing. When you take a look at them and you see the water uh, going in and the water going out, um, it's, it's quite a bit cleaner. It's really quite remarkable. So this is one design. This is a pretty common design. And like I said, you're gonna see this at our water treatment plant uh, as a type of clarifier. And uh, that's what they look like. Uh, this is um, another type of sedimentation tank. This one is more of a, um, it's a rectangular shape. So just shaped like this. And you can see kind of the same idea is you have water going in over here. And uh, as the water uh, goes from one end to the other end, the, uh, the flock or the coagulants are gonna start sinking and they're gonna get caught on this um, little conveyor belt thing. What it's gonna do is basically scrape things down and send them to a sludge pump of some, some sort. And uh, you can see the water itself is outgoing in the other end. And so another, uh, just another different type of design anyway. Like I said, there's a whole bunch of these things. Um, something we're not really gonna get into is that uh, they, all of these um, clarifiers, uh, there's, uh, they can only handle so much water in a certain amount of time. And uh, they all have different formulas or charts that, that work this kind of thing out. So if you ever become a water operator, this is something you might talk about is the, is the detention time. So how fast the water is allowed to go through that and still allow for adequate settling. And there's a formula there. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna really go into that at all. But I'll show you some, some pictures here of, uh, hold on, let me just, uh, gotta just go to the correct slide here. Just give me a second here. I wanted to show you some pictures of the clarification going on at our water treatment plant. And that's kind of where I wanted to finish off today. Um, I'll show you some more pictures next day. Uh, but what I want to show you is this one right here. Uh, sorry, I got to turn it up. So here's a coagulation tank uh, in, um, in our water treatment plant. So you can see it's sort of a square design. Just gonna go back one or two slides here and show you a couple of other things here. So you can see that uh, when they add the alum, They've got these mixers here. So you can see this big mixer here. This is called a rapid mixer and it stirs it up really quickly. And you can see how turbid the water is there before it's put into the, um, the clarification tanks. And you'll actually see that these things are run in tandem. So the first tank is a little bit more cloudy than the next tank. And as the water gets a chance to settle out, um, you can see it actually gets cleaner and cleaner uh, just by basically gravity. Okay, so I'm going to finish off there today, um, but I'll just say one more thing is that uh, you're going to notice that water treatment is mostly a chemical and physical process, at least for drinking water. And the contrast is with wastewater, you're going to see a lot of it is biological. So you're going to see some differences uh, with these two things, but we'll, we'll certainly get into that into the next few lectures. Anyway, so here's hoping the college can get its uh, IT department together and get whatever is wrong fixed with the, um, with the uh, network. Uh, like I said, hopefully it's not a worst case scenario here, but I'm hoping to see everybody in person on Wednesday. And I will uh, confirm the details of the test then.